think at this yeah. point. So welcome to the algebraic combinatorics seminar. It's a pleasure to have James Wilson give actually two short talks. The first one is about linear time solutions of simultaneous Sylvester equations. Okay, so the first thing I have to do is apologize to anyone who really knows things like control theory, because I'm gonna do, um, you know, a, an algebraist version of this, but that's not my goal. My goal is actually to study this equation and a generalization, which is showing up both in my field and some other fields. And um, if you recognize that we're doing something wrong, we do want to hear about it. And so let, let me know when you see there's a, something that we could improve. Uh, but anyway, for those of you who have not done control theory before, here is my shallow dive into the subject area. I learned it about, you know, over the last, say, three or four months as I was trying to say, well, what, what, where are people coming up with this problem outside of my own area? This seems to be the main home for this equation. So the nearest I can understand it is that you can imagine yourself trying to control, say, a robot or a satellite or some boat in the water, and you're going to take in information, and you'll have a model for how the behavior of your states are going, like where your paths are. And you might call that, you might have assumptions on it, like it might be a differential equation that models the position over time. But there's this extra little vector in here, you see C of T, and that particular one I'm going to call the control vector. And this is, say, me pushing the rudder to stern or to bow, whatever those words are supposed to be. Um, you know, I'm controlling my robot or my robot is learning and controlling itself. Whatever is the right thing to do, it's trying to stay on course to get to a target. That's the basic idea. But, you know, as in any real situation, you can only collect some of the data about the state. You have a window to look out of. So your observations might be a subset of the actual state. So you have a Y, which is the observations of your system. And you want to use that to then make the control as effective as you can. And so there's two sort of general goals here. The first one would be, can you actually find the control you need to steer to the target you want? That's like the main goal of actually don't crash your rocket ship. Um, but the other one is, it might actually not be a bad idea to know what the actual state is if you're using that in your model. And if you're making observations that are a subset of your states, you might want some version of an estimate based on the observations about what's going on. So with that in mind, let's take a simplified view of this. That's about as deep as I could do without uh, taking a course on this. Uh, so I'm going to look at the linear time independent situation. So this is a situation where you assume that your model is built from matrices, basically. So over time, each x of t is a vector, your control is a vector, and the way they change is by modifying by just a matrix multiplication, a, b, c, and d. And you can imagine this is a really good thing for a low-powered, you know, something up in space and so forth. Matrix multiplication is very efficient, or at least multiplying by a vector. You can make this really a good, good engineering choice, but it might not be the most accurate to a model. Let that be how it is. Then I'm going to assume also that this has a favorable property known as stabilizable. That means that I can recover the control by a matrix multiplication with my original position. This is somehow saying that as long as I do this, I'm going to be able to like, you know, guide my rocket where I want it to go. And you can ask me more about that. And I'll just simply say, Margaret, would you come on and tell us all? <laughs> so the, so I'm, I'm, I'm at the, you know, very near the end of what I know in the subject area. But let's pick up on the algebra that goes on here. If you just stared here and you didn't want to know anything about what was really going on, you would see four matrices happening simultaneously. You'd make a grid of A, B, C, and D. And you would then say, well, I'd like to have less information. I'm going to row reduce it, right? So I'm going to do what I can, solve for G here. This is a straightforward row reduction kind of problem. And then think about the new problem I get by reducing that dimension. This is always a good move. If you can get rid of some dimensions, your life gets easier. And for reasons that you can follow, but they're really outside of what I want to talk about today, you get a resulting different differential equation, which is the important one to consider. And it has some extra properties. So it depends on this stabilization, this thing you just solved for G, and then an external parameter, which I won't go into. Given that is the real problem of control, then there's this theorem of Lunaberg's, Lunaberger, um, that speaks to how we could use the information we have to make an estimate of X of T that's approximately good, at least asymptotically good, provided we could solve for X in this equation right here. And that's the fundamental equation that I want to focus on and this and many, many different variations show up throughout examples in engineering and control theory for roughly similar types of reasons. Different differential equations naturally lead to this kind of configuration.
So these are throughout the literature. And as such, you can imagine that there are algorithms almost anywhere you point that specialize in various properties of solving this. So what is it that you could add that's new to this? And we'll get to that in a minute. But I'll point out, if you really do care about this, there are plenty of people in the department who will talk to you, but you might just start with a simple reference and see where you go. So let's just look at a, a slightly different version of the question, where I have xa minus by equals c. This one you could actually give your students and ask them to solve it. Uh, just a disclaimer slide, I should have mentioned this at the beginning. I'm gonna take an idealized point of view here. I'm just gonna say field operations are, are perfect. We're not gonna have any kind of round off errors or things like that. Numerical stability is a huge issue, but I'm just not gonna deal with it in these slides. And whenever you're wondering what the dimension of the matrices are, just imagine they're square or close to square D by D matrices. That too can be relaxed, but I just don't wanna deal with the details. So this is what I would do if I was a student. I would move Y to one side of the equation. I just move the X's over and divide by B. And I'd say, look, professor, I'm done. And that's pretty efficient because you just pick out of the sky, whichever vector X you want, and now you get a corresponding Y. And okay, you could quibble as to whether B was really invertible, but that's a small quibble because at least if it's half invertible, like invertible on the left, you'll pull this off. So you have a pretty good chance at pulling it off by this method. And roughly speaking, if you needed to solve this, you wouldn't look much further than this kind of simple manipulation. So that can't be the real thing. So what was different was in this Sylvester type equation and various generalizations of it, you actually have a further constraint of x equaling y. And if you try this very generic idea out, you'll quickly run into some problems. So if I just move x's to one side, I have x's on both sides. I don't actually end up solving anything. It's no clear, obvious sort of simple algebra to solve it. And then you might say, well, I, you know, it's a system of linear equations. How, how bad can it be? But it's of course a matrix x. So it has d rows and d columns for d squared entries to solve for. So if you vectorize this, just make a big flat matrix, you end up with a d squared by d squared matrix to echelonize. And all of a sudden you have about d to the six operations to do. And just for back of the envelope calculations, let's compare how bad this just got by making the simple alteration of x equals y. If d was about 1,000, look, cell phones collect millions of points of data every time they take a picture. So 1,000 is still relatively small here. It would take about exaflops worth of work to do it this way. So that's about 100 megawatts of work at 10 gigaflops per watt compared to just 0.1 watt. So if you're doing this on a low power device, this is no longer feasible. So this is not, we, we wanna solve this in our control problem, but not by any obvious straightforward linear algebra. So when somebody tells you, oh, it's just linear algebra, challenge them a little bit to cost their linear algebra. And you'll find that maybe you need really careful linear algebra because this is completely out of anything realistic. So what can you do? Well, the key theorem and why Sylvester gets his name on his equation is that it was studied a long time ago, back in the theory of pencils and other things geometric in nature. And he observed that if you have square matrices with a common eigenvalue, then there exists a unique X that solves that Sylvester equation. And his proof is somewhat constructive, but not necessarily with the complexity you would imagine. He wasn't really thinking of programs. He was just thinking about existence of solutions. And uh, the solution that we now use, sort of the, the main starting point, there are other ones, uh, but a, a good clever algorithm to get you started in this direction is known as the Bartle Stewart algorithm. And the basics of this, I won't go into, I'll, I'll just go into the surface structure of this. But if I take the, the question is to do this in D cubed time instead of D to the six, so it's realistic time. And what I'm gonna first do is I'm gonna work to find a similar kind of decomposition to the thing we did on the first slide when we solved A, B, C, D and we moved everything into the corner. This is what's called a shore decomposition in the literature. If you find such a thing, you've reduced the dimension of your problem to just looking at the A tilde and the B tilde, and you get a sub problem that you can solve. I'm being a little bit oversimplistic, but that's the basic idea. I reduce the dimension by first prepping the matrix A and B to have this special shape. If I solve it on these small problems, I can pull back through these matrices and get to my full solution. Now, there is a technical problem that maybe A might not be invertible and might not be able to move this way. So you sometimes have to add a phase to this. Again, we're simplifying for the purposes of exposition. 
If you stand back and look at the bird's eye view of this, if you took xa minus bx equals c, this equation that we're trying to solve, you could see that the basic idea is to hit it with a matrix E on one side, a matrix F on the other side, and then consider this lower complexity question where you've prepared the A and B to be in sort of better form. And that's the, the rough idea for how a lot of problems like Sylvester type equations get solved is that you just hit them with dimension reducing matrices on left and right that also have favorable properties with the eigenvalues so you can reconstruct the original solutions. Uh, by the way, this should probably be a minus sign here, not a plus sign, so apologies for that. Now, why do I go through an old algorithm like this? Well, for one, it's quite pretty. If you look at this, I'm not sure each one of us would wake up in the morning and just know to do this. I think they deserve their name on it, so it's a clever algorithm. And it's also been tuned quite a bit. But the part that makes me struggle as, a, as an algebraist is it bothers me that it got so hard just by putting x equal to y. Like, what? we went from, like, a trivial question for our students to something that all of a sudden needs a name on it. And also we went from a place where we could pick any X and always have a Y to a place where there's a unique X just by adding X equal to Y. It feels like it's an unfair difficulty that's just emerged. And I want to get at why that happened. So the basic reason, at least from my perspective, is that it's not one equation. The point is, when we look at it as one equation and we use x twice, we really are thinking of this more original general equation, a, xa minus by equals c. But then we have a second equation depending on a different a and a different b and a different c. In this case, identity, identity, and zero. A pair of equations is certainly harder to solve than just a single equation. If you take that point of view, it might lead you down the right way of thinking about the algebraic geometry that's going on here we're basically tiptoeing from finite to tame to wild. And that relationship turns out to be something that explains how you should think about the problem when you go more general. I won't go into that in this talk, but that's part of the idea of here, of thinking algebraically about problems is try to figure out where have you seen this pattern before? The same sort of thing happens if you play with other relationships. You could make an X transpose show up or, or conjugate transpose, same kind of difficulties emerge. So from my perspective as an algebraist, the real problem is a simultaneity problem. You have a bunch of Sylvester equations that have to be solved simultaneously. And this question isn't without motivation inside my field. So it turns out this has been studied at least as long as it's been studied in engineering through a number of different papers. Um, some people know the connections through the Roth removal rule. You'll find that in, in many contexts. And that one summarizes something like this. If I was to take the A, B, and Cs and make them into a block upper triangular matrix, and I wanted to take it block diagonal instead of triangular, I'd have to get rid of the C. So I'm looking for a way to conjugate this matrix by some other matrix to get rid of the C. If you write down the equations, it's exactly what you expect the original Sylvester equation to look like. And that was observed, I guess, by somebody called Roth. I'm, I'm not entirely sure how his name got connected to it, but it's also quite a classical connection to make. Now, if you do this for multiple eyes, you will recognize a different nature for this. Because you'll say, these are the generators of a ring, and I have a module. And I'm asking if my sub-module splits inside of my larger module. Is there a direct complement as a module? That's what this question is actually asking. Another form of this question is to ask, what commutes with a single set of generators? So I have a bunch of RIs that generate a ring R, and I look for the matrices that commute with it, that's actually just describing the endomorphisms of a module, another common question in algebra. And a third one is adjoint algebras. This is the one I love the most. And this is asking for what commutes across an inner product or a generalization of that. Now, all of those have a very, very long history of being studied. And so they've all been solved, but with different strategies. Different people see it different ways. So it'd be nice to sort of back up, find what they have in common, and say, how do we make the best choice, okay? There's um, a number of people who study this in algebra in a programming language, or sorry, a programming system called the MEDAX, and Schneider was one of the main people working in that field. He went as far as to make a conjecture that it's actually required to be d to the six, that some of the situations will in fact require d to the six complexity. Um, I believe that is false, but I have only the non-degenerate cases handled, so we shall see. 
he might be right in the end, but it's, 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 it's looking less likely given what I'll be speaking about today. Again, you can just flatten everything and just look at the equations as linear equations. If you do that, the naive count will show you this is a highly overdetermined system, but it's still d squared by d squared or larger. So you don't expect many solutions to exist. If they exist, you have to know how to find them. It's also not very sparse. So all the kind of classic tricks of just hoping your computer uses special properties and structure are not gonna help you out. There's a lot of non-zeros here. And a random sampling of d squared rows will look basically like a random dense matrix. Not exactly, but it'll come close. And so your obvious solvers don't seem to benefit from this. However, any single person who writes down these equations as a matrix, I guarantee you will see structure. Here's an example, pretty small one, but still an example. I can't see how that's not an incredibly highly structured matrix to solve. So despite all the sort of quick statistics that tell you this should be a hard matrix to solve, I don't believe it, right? So D to the six is the foregoing expectation of how hard it is to solve, but you cannot convince even an undergraduate that this isn't a special matrix, okay? This has clearly got rich structure that we somehow have to mine without tripping up and doing D to the six work. So how do we do it? So I'm gonna propose that we can do it in D to the cube time, avoiding a few edge cases. And I'm gonna be imprecise about the edge cases until the very end. So the basic idea is that I'm gonna turn this back into a single equation. I said we should capitalize on multiple equations, that's okay. But the single equation I mean now is not one of matrices, but of a matrix, a tensor, a tensor, and a matrix. In particular, I'm gonna put little square brackets around the things that are tensors. Now, what do I mean by a tensor? If you've not thought of this before, if it's not a language you use, you could think of a row of scalars as being a one tensor. It goes in one direction. A grid, like a matrix, goes in two directions, rows and columns. That would be a two tensor. If you can go in three directions, then I'll call that a three tensor. You can think of that like a spreadsheet that has grids on it, but you can flip to the next page of the spreadsheet and the next page and the next page. And so you could really think of a filing cabinet worth. And in fact, that's how I think of a four tensor is I think of a filing cabinet where each drawer is a three tensor and there's several drawers. And you can go up from there to a whole library of any size tensor you want. That's my mental image handed over to you. If you don't like it, I'm sorry. <laughs> I've not come up with a better one. If you can draw a tesseract, then I guess you're, you're ahead of me, but I can't think in four dimensions. So the equation I now have is one equation with tensors. <coughs> the solution is going to also be tensor related. What I'm gonna do is the same idea as in the Bartle Stewart. I'm just gonna multiply on one side by a dimension reduction uh, matrix E, on the left by a dimensions re reducing matrix F, and then solve a smaller problem and lift. But there's a problem with that it's not gonna actually be multiplied by matrices. The point, the, the general theme I wanna get across here is meet a tensor problem with a tensor solution. So what I'm gonna multiply on the left and the right with is not only a, not a two tensor, it's also not a three tensor, it's actually a four tensor. So I'm putting two filing cabinets on either side of this equation. Now, just for notation on the slide, whenever I have a four tensor, I, I said I'd put square brackets around a letter for a three tensor, so a matrix is no, undecorated, that was a two tensor. One set of brackets is a three tensor, two set of brackets will be a four tensor, just in case you're wondering what this notation means. And immediately, if you look long enough, you'll say this makes no sense. In particular, the position A times F, what on earth do you mean to take a three tensor times a four tensor? Is it, what, 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 what is a filing cabinet times a box, right? That, that's what we've written here, but what is it really going to do? So while it's nice, pretty pictures, let's, let's actually do some math. So the first thing is to think of an abstracted model to draw what we're doing here. So a two tensor, I'll just put a blob on top of a wire. So inputs come into the matrix and they go out of the matrix. A three tensor, which I think of as sort of a spreadsheet or a box of grid paper, it has two inputs and one output. Okay, so I write it as a little triangle with three wires. The four tensor I said would be this awful looking, <laughs> A filing cabinet, and this is my best way to think about how to access it. I need a wire that tells me which drawer to look up. I need wires to tell me how far into the drawer to go. I need wires to tell me how far down on the rows and wires to tell me how far in. If, if you look at all that, you have four wires on this filing cabinet. So these will be my diagrams. 
Uh, these are called tensor network diagrams, or they're called string diagrams, or they're called operads. It depends on who you talk to. It seems like every subject area has discovered this on their own, named it in their own clever way. I'm going to go with string diagram. Sorry, tensor network diagrams, in honor of um, um, the physics literature, which I'll be using in the next talk. Okay. <clears throat> What does it mean to link two things together now? I have these diagrams with little whiskers on them. I bring two whiskers together. What am I trying to do there? Well, I think of a vector space on each wire. And so I have a left side and a right side. So I want to connect the two. How do you connect two vector spaces? With an inner product, right? You take a dual between the vector and the vector space. You make an inner product. You can sum over the scalars, and then you get a constant back. So this is exactly what dot products are doing inside of the matrix multiplication. If you ever teach matrix multiplication as a bunch of dot products, this is what you've been doing. Now you can generalize that. If you glue several wires together, you just have multiple sums. That makes a higher version of a dot product or a higher version of a matrix product or a what's generally known as a tensor contraction. So that's how we'll make sense out of a three tensor times a four tensor. We'll just do the sums over the corresponding coordinates. So now we can interpret the diagrams of the equations that I propose to use, right? I want to hit on the left by E, on the right by an F, that reduce dimensions. And you just wire the things together and you should run off and do it. But you'll start to realize there's a problem. So let's analyze the first diagram. How do you, why do we row reduce a matrix when we want to find the null vectors? It's because the vectors are on the other side of the matrix. So if you row reduce, you don't change the bases of V. And so you can make a simpler looking matrix without changing the place you're trying to solve for. In the same way, when you're trying to do sort of a row reduction of a three tensor, maybe you call it a filing cabinet reduction, whatever you call it, you want to attack the sides that don't have the variable. So we put F on the other side. That's pretty clean. But the trouble is, when it comes to the middle one, B, having put F on that side, the wires are now in the way. We can't get E to reach all the way into B without going through F. This filing cabinet of the F is pre-composed with B. So it goes through and messes up whatever B has before you can do the elimination that E is supposed to do to clean it up. And if you try this out by hand, this is what goes wrong on your graph paper. If you, if you like sit down with a matrix and you try to row reduce this, the reason it fills in and becomes nasty linear algebra is exactly this problem. The F and the E overlap non-trivially. You can see it in the graphic. And, and getting that not to happen feels like it's a nightmare. It's like, how do you figure this out? So that's our real problem to solve. Okay, so I'm gonna zoom into the matrix because I think people understand matrices better. Suppose that this was the matrix, you see the structure. I'm gonna try to do the obvious elimination that seems to be possible. I take A1 in the top corner and I use it to echelonize that whole row. Right? I'm gonna clear out A2, A3 and so forth. And if you sit down to write down what it should look like, It'll be a matrix like this, sort of a triangular looking shape matrix. And I'm going to multiply it all across all of these rows this way. So that's the goal that I have, right? Now this is blown up to the larger dimension. This is not the way to do it, but it's a way to conceive of the question. Now let's fold it all back up into the boxes, into the three tensors. So what I have is I have the first matrix A1 in blue, and then I have a bunch of the other matrices I'm trying to get rid of in this salmon color. I think that's salmon color uncooked salmon color. So if you take this, I want to get rid of the salmon with this blue. And so I'm going to say the visualization that I have in my mind is that I'm using the blue to echelonize the entire face, not just like a single scalar echelonizing a row, but a sheet of paper echelonizing all the papers parallel to it. So I clear out the rest of the drawer from the first slice, the first particular matrix in that corner. That's the, the tensor version of what I'm really trying to do. And if you stop, you can try this filing cabinet picture. I mostly just wanted to see if I could draw what in the head. It came out okay, but there's a diagrammatic version of whatever I just drew. So this is just proving that I can draw, which maybe you aren't convinced, but I will have a better picture in a second for that. I'm gonna say, let's agree that when our four tensor has only one drawer filled, that I'll put a little dot on the wire followed by a dangling wire and then the three tensor. There's a reason for this. If you look in the physics literature, this is called a controlled operator. And what the idea is, is that it only does something if the right state is on that top wire. It controls doing anything below. 
And if you stop to think about what the arithmetic of tensor contraction is doing, if you have a filing cabinet and you only put data in one drawer, then only if you're in that drawer does anything happen. Everything else is the identity, just passes through. If we are only doing this, we might be able to pull off our trick. And if we look up here to our previous diagram, that's what I claimed is actually going on. To do the space elimination, we only fill the top drawer. So we have one of these networks with a single control on the top wire and then whatever nonsense on the bottom wire. Should I pause for a question here? Okay. So with that in mind, the diagram we now have is this. To clear out the extra garbage out of A and prepare A to be a nice matrix, we use a controlled operation, a controlled four tensor. That little dot on the bottom wire and then whatever is needed to do the rest on the top wire. So now let's put that into our original diagrams. Oh, with one extra caveat. Take a look at what happens if you have two cabinets that are both filled in only one drawer. Then you can have the drawers just pass by each other because they're on different levels. So they commute, which is exactly what we need to pull off our trick. So the problem was that F was in the way of E coming along. But if in fact you only fill drawers in different spots, then they should glide right past each other. And that's exactly what makes this work. So while we are putting random four tensors in there, they're not that random. They're random and only to the extent of they're controlled on a controlled place. So when I do this F after E, or sorry, this E after F, I can slide the E in front and use that to cancel out all the extra stuff of B, thus reducing the dimension of B. The F reduces the dimension of A and they don't interfere with each other. What happens to C, who knows? That's just a bunch of constants. But we now have a smaller dimensional problem. We solve that by any method we like and lift the problem back up. So this is a, what we consider a high dimensional generalization of the bartle stewart algorithm with the caveat that you have to do it with tensors and not just any tensors, you design your tensors to commute with each other. Once you know, you feel like, well, of course I could have done that, but it took us a while, surprisingly longer than I'd like to admit. There are some loose ends. Um, I didn't tell you that everything was actually square. I said it was close to square. So at the beginning, you might have to fill the box with more blue slices because you might need enough to kill off the rest of the things there. There are some unfortunate edge cases when that happens. So there's a parameter that you need to know how many slices you need. And it's something that I'm sort of surprised it connects to this. It's something known as the slice rank, which Terry Tao used to prove something about the cap set conjecture. So it's a recently invented uh, metric. For us, it's a simple metric. We didn't know it was recently invented for wonderful things, but it's nice to be able to say, you know, Terry Tao's slice rank was useful in this. Um, but anyway, whatever that number is, that's the lower bound for the real complexity. On a generic problem, that's a constant. So we get the best complexity we could have, just the cubic. When you have very tall, skinny, like a Kellogg's box type shape tensor, that's when your slice rank goes up and you might have to have a slower complexity. This is where Schneider's problem lives. Surprisingly, his problem invited two matrices together. And when they're invited together, they seem to be sort of packed like this. The benefit though, is that because they're rings, you can multiply more of them together to make it a thicker box and then reduce the complexity. So instead of getting D to the third for Schneider's problem, we get D to the 3.5. That's still better than D to the six. So uh, that's where we are right now. The takeaway message, meet a tensor problem with a tensor solution. Thanks for your time. Yeah, thank you very much. Are there questions? I had a question about one of the things in the earlier part of your talk when you were sort of introducing this uh, sure decomposition. Was that, um, I know it was just the historical part, but uh, for the, yeah, solving that, that um, problem when you have the A and the B, what, was that for um, A and B had some common eigenvalue or something? I think I just missed. No, I, uh, there, okay, there are different algorithms to find that. I think this, the name sure form is that if you can get it like this, where the matrices that you're conjugating by are maybe unitary and upper triangular is like one definition, but there's generalizations for other fields apparently. No, it was a different slide where you had like the A tilde and B tilde and I felt like it was okay. leading towards something. Um, yeah, in the X equals Y case. Uh, I'll find it here, here we go. There it is, yeah. And I, I guess I didn't understand like 
how you got this big identity matrix in the upper left? Like what were, where do we Yeah, technically it's, it's, um, it's, you could have a phase there. You could have, you, you might have to shift in order to have things work out. So you, you would technically do like a lambda I minus A, and then you'd have to carry that parameter through but I didn't want to talk about it. So, so I there's just, like certain special forms you can put A and B in without changing really the fundamental equation somehow. Yeah, you changed it with your own number. So therefore you're responsible for keeping track of its effect. I see. Yeah, I see. that's right. That's you, you, you okay. cook the books a bit. Yeah, I was just, okay, thanks. I was just curious. Yeah, I, I decided, I was thinking about, do I include phase? And I said, no, I'm just, somebody asks, then I'll say yes. And you asked. Okay, great. So if you like, I don't know, Google or Wikipedia this, there's, there's more to it than what I'm saying. Um, Thanks. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, if not, I think we get to gather at Gather Town, which yes. um, is the link in the chat, perhaps? The link is in the chat. I have to figure out how to get so, there. Do I, do I stop sharing? So uh -huh. we can go into small groups. Um, 